so I was mingling. Here was the World Conference of Children in New York. It was an, a, a, a premier event. Never had happened before. And because I was covering the press conferences and there weren't any, that was my assignment, I was basically just hanging out with you know, Bush and Baker and... and uh, uh, I'm not thinking of any of the names now, but all the most well-known political international figures of the time. And, um, oh, sorry. No, I do have to back up. That's what happened second. Uh, oh, hold on. I'm sorry. It was Sunday, the second day. I was going to um, get lunch. And I came out, and my offices, our offices, were right near the Security Council chamber. And just as I came out, um, there, there were a lot of private meetings being held between different delegations, uh, negotiating, because they were, there they were, all in the same place. And at that moment, the um, uh, Soviet Union and Israel were reaching all kinds of agreements behind closed doors. And when I walked out, um, I saw a Shevard Nazi, who was the author of Glasnost, the, the thawing with the West. Um, but I was thinking, it was all this to do, and I thought, what does this mean? If I don't feel Baba in this, what is it worth? It just doesn't matter, none of it. And I thought, well, there's one thing I can do. And so I inwardly, I said, Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba, Mayor Baba. And I was looking across at the time at Shevard Nadzi, who the press was all around him asking him questions about these agreements. And as I started to take Baba's name, he suddenly looked up. I'm a significant distance from him and on a different level, kind of up by the escalators. And he grabs my attention, and he looks at me with this clear sign of recognition. And then, and it lasts for a solid minute, mo moment, you know. And then he looks down, he sees all those reporters again, and he just dismisses them and walks away. Um, later that afternoon, all the heads of state, Bush and all these other people were walking by, and we all had to back up so that they could pass. And over at the other side, there was Shevard Nazi, and he sees me, and he goes, oh, Sorry, my arm hurts. He goes, oh, hi. He rushed, he gestures. Years pass, the Soviet Union breaks up. He's, uh, he recognized Baba's name, clearly, uh, on some level. After the Soviet Union broke up, I was covering a Security Council meeting. Shevard Nazi was now the president of Georgia, the former Russian state of Georgia. And the conference, the, the, the Security Council meeting was quick, and I... I looked, I asked my partner, I said, is Shepard Nazi still here? I was curious. And he said, he's right over there. And I turned around and he was, again, the other end of the room and he went, give me a big wave, hi. I don't know him, we've never spoken, but I, <laughs> I said Baba's name and he recognized it. Um, something Baba was doing with my being there had having to do with the US and the Soviet Union and with, but I don't know. But I did, yep. which is which feeds into this conversation, which says, Bobby, use me. However you want to use me. I really don't have to know what's going on. Yeah, beautiful. Did, yeah. So that's one story. There's another I can tell later. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I mean, there you have what Baba, you know, can do on a, on a actual larger level than most of us are dealing with, you know. Anyone else want to venture out? We got Rainey for a little bit of Francis Brabazon if we get starved, you know, for poetry. Anyone yeah, else? Sorry, I will join in. I have something important to share. Good. Ooh, I, I, I'm getting a call, but go ahead. Can you email without the mic or should I go get the mic? Can you hear me without the mic? We can hear you perfectly, honey. Okay, great. So one of the very important things for me, as when I was very young, um, after I'd been around the abode for about three years, it came out an amazing book available to all of us called The Word at 
world's end. Now, it's very tough to get through the first section of this book, Dreams of Wet Pavements. But if you can get through the first section of this book, it leaves you wide open to the glorious, esoteric latter sections of this book. And it is about the world. And when Rano was typing this for uh, Francis, she went to Barbara and said, I can't stand it. I can't do it anymore. I can't take it. I can't type it. We're talking Rano here, <laughs> who never said she couldn't do anything for Barbara. And Barbara said to her, just keep taking my name. This is a very important, this is very important for my work. And uh, of course, it was published before in Dust I Sing. And I'll just read, I suppose it's Rick Chapman's take on this book in the little ad that used to come out with it when it was published, which is a treasure and I found in my things I didn't know I had. The Word at World's End by Francis Brabazon. In five sections of diverse poetic st style, Francis Brabazon relentlessly wields his caustic wit to peel away the last veils covering our dying civilization. Uh oh. <laughs> In five sections of diverse poetic style, Francis Brabazon relentlessly wields his caustic wit to peel away the last veils covering our dying civilization. This book couples unparalleled imagery with a stunning honesty as the author turns his penetrating gaze to the art, the religion, the everyday life of man on this planet today. The word at world's end will end in centuries future stand as the most eloquent document of the death rattle of the contemporary spiritual wasteland. Did you catch that, Tony? <laughs> the death rattle. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> it's one of my favorite books. Right yeah, now. the death rattle of the contemporary spiritual wasteland. Yet, the book is Phoenix also, sowing the seeds of the new humanity amidst the ruins of cadaverous illusions. It's very easy to think that Francis is so negative, so caustic. But in actual fact, it's a view from a Mundali of a world that's not suiting Baba's purpose at all. <clears throat> and it has to be recreated. And if it can't be recreated, it has to be reborn. It has to, something has to happen because he's told us the new humanity has to happen. And um, I, I can see why uh, this is so important. And of course, the la latter section, Hymn to God the Man, is pure devotion. It's absolutely an exquisite, poetic, beautiful form. But you do have to get through the first section. You can't cheat. You have to get through dreams of wet pavements of what went wrong and why it went wrong. And it's so obvious why it went wrong. Because it left spirituality behind. It left the heart behind. It left us isolated, actually, because it's so dysfunctional for the spiritual person in the city. So, yeah, I'll read a couple of things out of it later. Jay Baba. Okay, yeah, beautiful kind of framing that, yeah. Can you read one little thing right there just to give us the, um, the, the, the vision the positive the course, Okay, I'll ask, go here. Go here, the caustic or the beautiful? <laughs> she said the beautiful. All right, good. Okay. Uh, you have to memorize it, you see. This is oh. actually, this whole book is actually on uh, Baba Tube. Myself, Rosalie, and Chris Barker read the entire thing for people to listen to. Mm -hmm. ah. Always alone. Oh, this is from uh, 64 from how I oracled it. 
it's from after the flood, so it's not from him to God the man. So I better skip <laughs> or go here. In one moment of your perfect manhood, ever beloved, would we be eagles of praise to you. Ever are we dust trying to sing your glory. How beautiful you are. What a dreaming in the dawn is your brow. What oceans of love are your eyes. What music of our new singing is in your throat. What a proud new architecture is in your hands. How perfectly shaped are your feet for our beyond journeying. The symmetry of your body is the assurance of our well-being. You are the song of all singers who have ever sung. You are the tenderness of lovers of all time. The line of your mouth is the direction of our journey. The curve of your cheek is the contour of our containment. In your fingers is the cunning of all the works we shall make. In your eyes, the love of all our loving. How marvelous was your creating. One beautiful, wow, magnificent. That was glorious. Anyone else? up for coming forth. I mean, how, I mean. Margie just uh, raised her hand. Good, Margie, go for it, yeah. And we get to even see her, yeah. Okay, there we go. Hi everybody, Jay yeah. Baba. Um, so this is a, a theme that has been very prevalent <laughs> in the last uh, couple of years of my life because I, when I was younger, I worked in the center and I had decided for myself um, that that was what I was going to do or work in India or something. And so I had this really rigid mentality that if I was going to serve Baba, the only place I could do it would be in Myrtle Beach or in India or somewhere like that. And I think I begrudgingly, uh, begrudgingly kind of went into the world. And it, it, I had decided that my life was on pause until I finally was able to work at the center. And of course, you know, Baba has other plans of his own. Um, and I, I, I don't know kind of how it happened, but it was time. And Baba did some real ego grinding on me, but uh, he kind of showed me that the, that you know everybody who loves him, if they all come to Myrtle Beach and they come to India or these places of refuge, so to speak, what about the pain in the rest of the world? And he kind of showed me that you know when we go and I mean I'm in Tempe, Arizona, which is never where I thought I'd end up, but. I was like, why am I here? What am I doing? This is such a waste of time, yet my life has brought me here. And then when I stepped into finding Baba in the now, he started showing up in all these places for me. Even like I was working at a, at a gym and it was like every person, it was overnight I made this connection that Baba was in the world, not just in Myrtle Beach. And people were coming into the gym and I was seeing Baba in, in these people's faces. And then like we had to mop the front area of the um, floor. And then all of a sudden I like heard Baba saying like, don't you see you're working at the center? Cause you know, I was cleaning cabins and I was there and he was showing me that I was working for him in this greater spectrum of the world. And uh, so then I, so I just recently went back to Myrtle beach for the use of and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go and it's going to be so easy. And I'm going to, I was just going to be everywhere. And, uh, he actually did the exact opposite. It was like, I couldn't, I had trouble seeing him in people at the center. And what he showed me is like the, 
the need for that in the world is so much greater than at his center because when you're out in the world he has to work through us when he's when you're on the center or, or india or anything he's working he's working directly he doesn't need a vessel and so then i got back to arizona and i had this overwhelming gratitude for all the people that uh, the people of walmart i could say <laughs> And I was seeing Baba in all of these people more than I ever had because I had a whole new perspective of it, of this is really where Baba is and where Baba needs the most help too. Beautiful, Margie, wonderful. And she came as a little young girl on the center with these lovely golden ringlets and everything <laughs> and spent all those years, it's fantastic. No, that's beautiful, you expressed that wonderfully. Really. Anyone else want to piggyback on that? Can I can I ask a question to some yeah. to Margie? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Having come from a Baba, you were raised in a Baba family. Mm -hmm. So do you feel that? You know, I know sometimes people from a Baba family don't feel the connection just because it, it, he doesn't necessarily come in your heart just because he's in your parents. Yeah. But did you feel from the beginning all the promises that we somewhat enjoy as adults, that he's our constant companion and that he's there to help us get down the road? Did you always know that or was there some lost time? Um, I did, but it was veiled. So I look back now and I did. And he was there every, every second. I was, my mom was very Catholic and then my dad was Bob lover. And so she was very against Baba, but I would talk to Jesus the way I talk to Baba now. So the presence of God was always there. And when I would go to the center, the center was my favorite place in the whole world because I felt love and I would go secretly. I don't know why, but when I was like six and seven years old, it was like I was doing something naughty or wrong. I would sneak to the lagoon cabin and I would yell at Baba and I would say, why can't you just prove to me that you're real? And uh, so, I mean, obviously you wouldn't talk to, like I wouldn't talk to something that I didn't actually believe was real. Um, but, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, and so I, I always felt God. And then when I went to India my first time, I, I always say it was Baba went from something to everything. That was kind of the, so I was 14, but I always accepted Baba but it was more of my dad's thing. And I had my own relationship with God. And then when I went to India, I'll just, that story, it's a sweet little story. I, uh, my mom committed suicide when I was 13. And so I had been writing all of these letters of like anger and sadness and all of these things I'd been feeling. And I, I threw them in the Duni in, in Maribad. And it was like a physical weight that Baba took off of my chest and all of the grief and all of the pain that I've been feeling was totally gone. Absolutely. It, it didn't exist. It was bliss. And like, I think it was a continuation of my Baba story because I can see I had a rough couple of years in my teens and uh, he held like in his infinite compassion, he held all of my grief for me and it and I got to see that like he almost like felt all that grief for me and then when I was old enough to to actually deal with it he let me like he didn't I wasn't exempt from the lesson Baba just took on all that like all that grief hmm. <laughs> yeah we used to Try to, and you, you also felt you were responsible to some extent for your mother's uh, taking her life. That was, we talked a lot about that. Yeah. Oh, Baba. Wow. Very touching. And that's, that's our Baba. That's our Baba. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Well, I'll, I'll just say something in here, just while, and hopefully 
When I, uh, I, I came from a, a family that was kind of socially active and, you know, trying to make the world a better place. And, you know, then I get this job at the center where I'm just kind of cleaning cabins and I mean, this is like a, nothing to do with in making the world a better place, seemingly. But <clears throat> I read where in, in the discourses, Baba says, he receives our song at the local level, spiritualizes it, and broadcasts it to the world at large. I read that. I'm almost like you got your little garage band, and you've come up with some songs and everything. You send it up to New York. They mix it, and then it gets on all the radio stations throughout the country. In other words, whatever we're doing at a little local level, and if we give it to Baba, even if we're just out in a rose garden, just tending roses in, uh, in a neighborhood, if, if it's given to Baba, it's spiritualized and broadcast to the world at large. And I, I felt, wow, that, that may be the most potent agency of world change, you know, that, that Baba does. Whatever we give to him, he can, can amplify it and give it, give it out to the world whether we're aware of it or not. So that, that was, uh, yeah. Anyway. We have a hand in Molly Jones. Yeah. You're still uh, muted. Okay, here I am. Ah, good. Well, I, I would like to say about our Baba Lover's relationship to the world I think it's a very individual thing because we're all so different from each other. And I think whatever is our calling, whether it's, you know, like Tony and a very large scale or what you were just talking about, we have to trust in what in Baba's guidance is for us, whatever we do. So I think it doesn't really matter um i think i think we all have to just find our own calling and and relate to that and just what you just said just trust that it it is just as big somewhere bob i talked about things if they were small or large it didn't matter exactly and, yeah and so um I think because I live, I live really far from any other Baba lovers. I don't have a lot of interactions. Um, so I'm much closer to my local friends, my neighbors. Object. But, pardon? Mm -hmm. Oh, so, D Diane was somehow oh, okay. uh, came up. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I feel, I feel like, I mean, it's, it's kind of silly, but I live kind of right on the edge of this community. And I, I just, I think of Baba with Aaron gone. And I think of that, how he, it's like somehow my relationship to, to people who are close to me, I feel like I'm, that's what I'm often called, where I'm often called to really bring him forth through through whatever way I can. Through so, through the personal interactions. Right. Yeah. 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 Beautiful. Yeah. I, I think most of us that's uh, that's the what's most natural to us. And I, I guess I said Bob Jager's name before he even knew he was gonna raise his hand. Yeah. So Bob, well, go for it. Yeah, yeah um, what, what Molly said just reminded me about that same quote. I think it's in the discourses when Bob talks yeah. about small things and big things. It, it's, it's impossible for, you know, the, me to assess it, it, the impact of anything. But, but when Bob says that, you know, a, a kind word or something that gives someone comfort or uh, just a smile or you know can, can mean can mean so much they, because he can use that to pass on 
kindness and generosity and and uh, and love and um, it, it it's so easy in the circumstances of the world today. Well, for me especially, after having lost my wife a year and four months ago, to feel utterly useless. What what am I what am I do what am I supposed to do, Baba? What am I what am I doing here? Well, for me, it's it's just wandering. It's helping my neighbors when I can, wandering around the neighborhood, petting dogs and smiling and saying hello to people, and and uh, it's it just. Um, Sometimes it feels like that's 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 absolutely the best thing that I can do. I mean, I can't. People who can do those, who can be involved in very active ways, you know, bless them. I really, I, I'm just, I'm not built that way. I've never been able to do that. And I, I, I really admire them and thank them for that. But I think we we all have our own ways of of helping and. Um, and, and yes, Jeff, giving it to Baba and, and letting him do whatever he wishes to do through us and with us. Just, I, I feel like that's that's the key, so. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Bob, yeah. Tony? Yes, hi. Um, I kind of feel almost a responsibility to share this story, but I wanna say, First, that um, I, I really appreciated those 30 years at the UN and all that Baba worked in my relationship with him. Uh, but when I was hit mandatory retirement in 2012, I was so happy to be a civilian again and to be able to <laughs> relate to Baba with my own gifts, you know, not the ones that it was like I was called into service. But um, the story I want to share is about um, the war in Bosnia. Um, I, was, um, I was walking down the hallway again near the Security Council chamber and I passed this person and it was Radovan Karadzic who was the head of uh, the Bosnia, president of Bosnia, I think of Serbia, Serbia. And I did not, he was a medical doctor, I knew that. I did not know there was a genocide going on in Bosnia and that he was the source of it. All I knew was that as I got close to him, I got chills and my blood ran cold. Uh, later, I, I asked about him. Uh, but this is when the genocide then, after that, began to really pick up. And it was my darkest time at the UN because I had to report on all of this day after day after day in, a, in minute detail what was being said, what was being done, what wasn't. And the thing about it was it seemed so relentless that there was nothing, it was a guttural thing that they couldn't stop themselves. And when I, if you heard me sing my song, Heal Us, Baba, part of what went into that was my awareness of the woundedness that was in, in that region, propelling these people to randomly kill so many of their brothers and sisters. And at the same time, and so I saw no hope out of this despair, you know, and I just grappled with it. But at the same time, I was, I, I became very interested in A Course in Miracles a few years before that. And I've shared here that I think Baba gave that book out incognito. And I also was a fan of Marianne Williamson, who has a way of explaining, popularizing what the course is about. So we would go once a month, I would go once a month to hear her speak at town, town, town Hall. She'd give a talk, she'd take a break, then she'd answer questions, and then she'd hang out afterwards for people who came up to the stage. And um, in that in-between period where people were asking questions, I saw one of the um, Finnish reporters from the UN. And she goes up to Marianne and she says, Marianne, I tell you, you must take this message to the marketplace in Bosnia. They must hear what you are saying here. This is so important that they hear this. And God bless Marianne, she walks the walk with this stuff. And she was not going to, like, oh, yes, I should go to Bosnia and, and be the one to save the world. She said, Elvi, let me think about it and let me see what comes up. Shortly thereafter, very quietly behind the scenes, we, we learned that Marianne was behind this. 
she spoke to the, the delegations of Bosnia and she arranged a global moment of prayer and meditation for peace in Bosnia. And it was going to be like, it's say, 6 a.m. in L.A., 9 a.m. in New York, all around the world, the, this precise time. And as it happened, I was going to India around then. And so I found myself in Baba's Samadhi on that day and absolutely was clear about the importance of participating. And so inside Baba's Samadhi, I explained everything I'd been seeing and witnessing and what was going on there and just put it all in his hands. There's, there's so much suffering, Baba, and it's relentless and it's compulsive. And I was only in India for a month when I got back to New York against all odds and then some, the war in Bosnia was over. I, it took my breath away. That looked like it was never going to end. And there was no hope of it ending. And through some diplomatic thing, it was done. So that the power of prayer, but especially of a lot of people joining in a consciousness and bringing it to Baba, um, yeah. I, I think is very powerful. Uh, it seems like a big thing I was involved in, but it's just what, um, I forgot your name now, Molly was just saying, it's you give yourself to Baba to, to ideally be remembering him, knowing that as you remember him, he uses you for whatever he wants, locally, globally, in your yeah. family. You know, I think it's the same exact thing. It's just, it's up to him where he puts you, you know. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful, lovely, wonderful story. Anyone else? Ah. Margie. You're up. Hi. <laughs> Sorry to pipe up again. I talk a lot, so I won't. I'll, uh, after this, I'll be done. But <laughs> um, we talked about this at um, Yusahavas, and somebody shared this, which I had never heard um, Eric say, but they said that they were in Monterey, or their parents were in Monterey Hall, and the story was referred back to them that they were asking Eric about this topic specifically. And Eric said, You have to learn what your gifts are so that um, you can know how best to serve your love to the world. I thought that was so beautiful because it was such a nice way to sum it up. But it's, it's not like we're going out into the world and doing all these things. It's just that we're serving Baba's love in the way that we are able to project it. Yeah, beautiful. Excellent. Yeah. That was kind of what Molly was saying. You find out where you're, where, where you're most naturally suited, where your talents are, and then love from that place with Baba's love. Anyone else? We're going to get around to you, Goer, at some point. <laughs> no, that's, uh, does anybody, f oh, go, oh, we got. Patty Curtis. Yeah. And then Marion is in the on deck circle. Hello, everyone, and Jay Baba. Wonderful to see everybody. It's been a long time for me. Um, you know, I, I'm just going to come in a little bit on that this theme of uh, the gifts that we have and that we come into this lifetime with and and also at various stages in our life from my perspective now when I heard about Baba in 69 to now some you know 50 plus years later my work My perspective has obviously changed from the lens I was looking through then to the lens I'm looking through now. And in my early years, I was not really aware of giving everything so completely to Baba, uh, to have Baba work through me. I mean, those people who, the young woman who just spoke that was so sweet, she was saying that, you know, she came to Baba, you know, went to Baba Mar Marizad at 14 and raised in a Baba family. And, and, and so her ability per perhaps in her awareness had already been um, awakened deep enough for her to know these things that when I was younger, I didn't actually realize 
Um, and my livelihood for my whole life was working with people for 33 years, which I love to do and I was skilled at, but I also always knew I was a conduit for Baba. And through my work with one-on-one -on -one clients, Baba's photograph was always there in the salon and there was always comments and I would go to India and then I'd come back and I'd tell the stories. And so I know clearly during that, those 33 years, my life was really in his hands and he worked a lot through me. I, I have no doubt about that. But I also have a little bit of feeling about when I retired and I was still doing a home business, so I would reach out and had uh, people. It, it felt very different for me and, and my perspective of which I engaged was different. I, I didn't feel so directed by Baba, but I too realized that the Walmart and all the places oh. that I patronize, Baba's everywhere now. From, from this eyes, I don't think I thought that way when I was in my 20s, but I surely feel that way now. So um, whatever happens, Baba is doing through me when I am focused on him and I give it all to him. And so, but I have seen over the years that the change in the level of which I might take responsibility for in the beginning, but now I have no uh, qualms about knowing that it's really whatever he chooses to do through me, because if it's really him, I'm always surprised at what comes out, actually. You know, it's uh, it's very, very uh, different when I'm feeling used in the way that his intent is strongly um, put. So anyway, I just thought I'd chime yeah. in on that a little bit. Yeah. Jay Baba. I like yeah, Eris used to say, you know, I know how I would behave, <laughs> yeah. and I know when, when I've been eclipsed. Yes, Baba doing things through me. Exactly. Uh, you know. I mean, it, it, <laughs> exactly. You know, uh, we had a little Sahabas here in the Northwest yesterday for a day, and I was unable to get up there for a variety of reasons. But they allowed. We had a panel on the early seventies of the people who the topic was that and uh, i had been asked to be on the panel and when i it was clear i wasn't going to make it they provided a zoom session and i was able to to be there through the zoom and share some stories and and uh when you talk about eclipsing i had i had specifically timed my prayers and you know was waiting for my there was a film they were showing about the early 70s that i didn't get to see but but then i i asked baba please baba please you, you, you want me to speak of this and I'm not really certain what to say, but you just tell me and then, you know, it, it'll be fine. I'll just, I'll do it. Cause I was a little hesitant about it. But honestly, when, when I was invited to share something, I got so eclipsed that, that the whole thing happened without hardly me knowing. And, and there wasn't a dry eye in the house, including mine. I couldn't even hardly speak. I mean, it was phenomenal. But it was wonderful because the energy was so Baba and it was such a, a beautiful, anyway, a beautiful thing. And that's what happens when Baba is there, you know, it, it, it's so much more full and so, I don't know, alivened and quickened and beautiful. So anyway, yeah, yeah very fun. Yeah. Right. Beautiful. Marianne, Marianne Lewis from New York. Thank you. I'm so I'm just so grateful for this evening. So I'm going to share just a couple of minutes about me personally and about politics, and um, and that is what came to my mind when I read all that you had written. Is that in New York City? I have my New York City politics, and there's local council people, and then there's then there's the state. There's state representatives and senators, and then there's the U.S. senators. And to keep that all straight is enormous. So I do, I have a list of what district I'm in and all that. And I do vote. And um, for my whole life, from the time I registered to vote when I was 21, I was always an independent. And I always had the 
ability to kind of weigh and evaluate all sides of things and listen to others, which then got me to notice even today, it's very interesting, um, when I'm listening to others, how many emotions come up around politics. And emotions is, as we know, beliefs come through the mental body to the subtle body where there's all the emotions and then into the physical body. And so I'm trained in kind of reading, structured listening, noticing uh, energy. So I have to notice my own too. And so my reactive state, my emotional state. So I have to, if I'm evaluating anything, who I'm gonna vote for, or if there's somebody new and there's opposition, and then I have friends who are sometimes will yell about somebody with curse words that they don't like and they're not gonna vote for. And I'm kind of considering, oh, well, maybe this person's kind of interesting. So I have to deal with all these emotions and attitudes and feelings. So, <laughs> um, and so I noticed that because for me around politics and a politician, it's about intention. Well, I don't know everybody's intention, but if I know mine, I have a much higher sense of discernment about others if I know what my intentions are. And are they to give my power over to somebody, a politician who I think can take care of me, or is it somebody I think I can control? So I'm always looking at that and the lower self because I'm trained a lot in releasing the lower self. And the lower self is all that lust, greed, pride, hate, anger, judgments, you name it, and I got it. However, I, when I know how to release it, I'm not identified with it. And it's transformative. And what I've learned is that the core of each lower self quality is a divine aspect. So it behooves me to go through my lower self and all my judgments and whatever they are about anybody uh, so that I can find that divine aspect, which of, of course is Baba speaking to me. And so it's been interesting to uh, now with a lot of things going on where there's some um, um, voting coming up, there's some elections coming up. And what I found now at this time in my life as a elder is I'm not doing the things that I was doing a lot younger, maybe marching around and things. But I find for me, and this is personal, a letter, because uh, now with a lot of, in New York City, we've had so many people shooting each other. It's just rampant. And I know it's the unconscious coming to conscious because it has to happen for the new humanity to emerge, that has to happen. So it's just as rampant. Well, one person who was gaining some popularity of uh, somebody I respect, a politician, about gun control and getting some laws passed. Well, I sent the statistics from 2021 of the rate of suicide of young people from around the ages of 10 to 24. And it's the second highest form of death for these these people and it's growing and more little uh, young even younger ones are killing themselves so I sent those statistics and they are huge of the amount of young people killing themselves so I put the statistics in there and I said they, his his staff could update them and I was saying this was indicative to me of all of the um the institutions that need to change how families how they raise their children how children are raised to release their emotions and to clear the, the subtle body, uh, the energy field. I didn't say, I said it in terms that I thought the person could understand, but I knew what I was coming forth with that all these institutions have to change. Um, and then I summed it up with these people who are not having that support and our young people, they're either killing somebody else or they're killing themselves. And both aspects of the spectrum need to be looked at. And um, so I wrote a really, really good letter and I keep up with that when people are wanting to build themselves up about their doing with gun control is to look at some of the causes. So that's where I am. I just want to end it with that because it's very personal for me. I just want to share personally also because I share everything that everybody's speaking about, you know. And so it's following um, and connecting and doing my spiritual practice and releasing my own lower self so that I have much more clarity. So that's it, yeah. thank you. Beautiful, beautiful, Marion. And, and yeah, you're, you're a little more actively involved in the, in, the, uh, in the legislation and that type of thing. We've got Jeremy. Team Mayor Bob All. Yeah. 
Can everyone hear me? We can hear you yes. yeah. perfectly. Basically, um, I think that, you know, when it comes to when we when we when we look at the at our um, what our role is in or what per se what my role or what our, our role is in in affecting global change or at least how to deal with problems of the the affairs of the world and how difficult they may be and I know they're they are um, really innumerable and quite massive um, I I guess I think in the face of of awe struck and wonderment it we most I think most of us preside over peace love and happiness that most of us really want freedom from hunger freedom from war freedom from um strife and difficulty and freedom from um you know the the all the evil in the world um and there's a lot to be done there really is a lot to be done i think we've come a long way i think that you know we really are on the home stretch now and baba has a way of of speeding up time and slowing down time at the same simultaneously in 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 sync with one another baba has a way of slowing down time and speeding up time so i wasn't sure if i said it right when i said in the face of awe struck and wonderment that we turn to baba to um kind of run the affairs of the world much like the perfect masters the perfect masters knowing that they have uh um a lot of supernatural or maybe not supernatural but they have um extraordinary insight into the globe or the universe that uh my only sense is, um, Jeff, that I think we've we've come a long way, but there is a monumental amount of work that needs to be done, and I don't really follow the news. Really, I don't fo- I don't get a newspaper or follow the news, but I can only sense that every once in a while when I turn on the TV and I I do and I see how bad things are. I I tend to just feel like, well, you know, Baba is among us so he is he is there to uh guide us and to lead us and to make things right to redress the adversity of of uh of uh whatever you call it evil sickness of the world so john mayor baba yeah thank you jeremy yeah. You, you've come a long way, Fred, and I'm really glad that you're part of us. And uh, thank you. That was wonderful. Wow. Thanks, Rainey. I, I, I really enjoyed all you said, too. I, I've been listening to the lectures, and I always love what you have to say, Rainey, particularly because you're, you're, you're really, you, you really are a high seeker. <laughs> well, I like to be everyone's auntie, too, and I'm your auntie as well. <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Rainey. Thanks, yeah, beautiful. Any other comments? Let me ask you, now, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Izzy, but any, any uh, you know, you're, you know, what, you're in high school, right? And what, what are your feelings uh, about the, I mean, just to kind of get your point of view, I mean, anything you can say about your impressions? of being in this world and and having Baba there with you. You can pass also. No, I'll, I'll say something. Um, well, 
there was a lot, but um, yeah, I've always kind of felt like a connection to like India for some reason. And like even, I don't know exactly why. And then um, I've had some friends that were Baba lovers that I've like been friends with for a while, but I've never like been really interested in it. And then I was kind of, um, I wouldn't say forced, but like I went to youth Sahabas without like having much of an option. And then I enjoyed it so much and I'm so glad I went. And ever since then, I felt like a great connection to Baba. And now I'm doing like research and going to the center all the time. Like I'm going, I went, last week I went at least two times and then this week I'm going like three times. So um, yeah, I felt, I feel so much love there. I get so emotional as well. Um, but yeah, I feel like I'm a happier person when I have Baba influence my life. Um, yeah. Beautiful. I know he's made all the difference in, I'm sure, all of our lives from that there's someone there that has our back. Always there to, to help out. Any any other? What, oh, yeah, it's for... Ah. Gabriella. You're still muted. Gabriella. What a wonderful topic of conversation. And um, I, I was listening on my phone and then I switched to my computer so I could now join in. But I just wanted to say, uh, for me, of course, different times, I loved what somebody said about different times of life. It's different. But right now, just speaking of the now, you know, I'm, I'm disabled, so I need help. And I've had terrible um, problems with the agencies. So I just ended up putting my neighborhood and um, these young women, two, three, four, four, if you really want to count them up, young women in the, in the past year have, have showed up to, to assist me. And, um, you know, not Baba lovers, but the, the last two were very young. The one was 18 and one was 19 and was much younger than I would normally have assist me and help me, but these girls, uh, women, young women, are brilliant and kind, and I, it's so clear to me that they are of the new humanity, and it's also clear to me that, yeah, I'm here. I was supposed to be in this position. You know, I, it looks like I'm just needing help all the time, but I was clearly, you know, they have issues at this age. They have questions. Um, I was lucky enough to um, have the Sadra. I have the Sad Baba, one of Baba's Sadras here at the house. So they've been sort of helping me with putting flowers and cleaning and 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 and, and ask a lot of questions about Baba. And um, I think I'm going to come with one of them to the center in October, possibly to have Sisney. So you know, why are you put in certain places at certain times? I guess it's always somebody in front of you. Um, and when I was in the hospital, I remember, you know, having discussions with the nurses or a discussion with other patients or, you know, and it's not always directly about Baba, but sometimes it's just, you feel that flow of love through you that Baba throws through, through your, flows through your heart and you know it's him because you don't have that much love. So he's sending it. And how could you see that and just you know, like you said, the people at Walmart, whoever, wherever you are, that it doesn't happen with everybody. For me, it happens, though, um, often enough to have the hallmark of that. Uh, and, you know, right now, Israel is going through all this stuff. Um, and I have family in Israel and all that. And I'm sitting with Baba Sadra. That's what I'm doing. And, 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 I, and, and not really even, I'm just putting the whole world in his hands, as he says, you know. He's got the whole world in his hands. So I, I, I can feel how Bob is changing me over these years, um, changing my co concept of love, 
make me realize that what I thought used to be love isn't even love anymore. Um, I don't even know what love is anymore. Well, that's the thing. Bewilderment. Who was saying that about bewilderment? Bewilderment. Um, but uh, I know it's all basically in the right direction. Um, so and I just wanted to share that bit, of, particularly about, I mean, you said that about being an auntie, a rainy, and I feel like, yeah, I'm a, like these girls' auntie. That's right. That's I get to be their auntie. How wonderful, you know, is that? That's it. Thanks. Yeah. I, I mean, I personally feel that um, Baba came as a person this time, emphasizing the personal, because I think one of the greatest agencies of, of bringing love into the world is person to person. You know, it, it's not through meditation, but our interactions, the give and take of love. And he's bringing the personal into a world that's becoming increasingly impersonal. And, yeah. So, oh, Rainy. Us, because Gabriella spoke, a couple of um, things came into my mind. Number one is that amazing discourse in John Grant's book that Baba gave at Avatar's abode. I am God the Father this time, but I am also God the Mother because I am disabled. And there's a lot to um, go into there about uh, disabilities in Baba. I live with it also for 42 years here. But the one thing about disabilities is the, the hourly change <laughs> or the government change or AARP to Humana, pardon me for talking in talk to Gabriella there. <laughs> And you can just be yourself. You can just walk into the pharmacy. And the next thing you know, you're confronted by a sociopath of six foot two, like no one you ever let, <laughs> met in your life, being an absolute jerk to you. So one thing I have learned, uh, as Tony was saying, in that situation over and over is just, oh, there it is. Baba, Baba, Baba. Baba and try and push the anger back behind it, the reaction, or as um, our dear Sue Chapman says, impulsiveness when you're immature, don't go there. It won't solve anything. Just make yourself go, Baba, 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 Baba. Slowly he softened to something intolerable instead of something murderous. And <laughs> good. God, but I didn't, I just kept it up. I mean, certainly it was passive aggressive. It wasn't completely calm. And um, anyway, but here was the price. I got in the car and had something I rarely have, an absolute panic attack, and I was shaking so hard I could not drive the car. So I wanted the white fluffy slipper, but it wasn't in the car. I wanted to throw something at Baba. So I just kept it up, Baba, Baba, Baba. Barber till I calmed down enough to drive to my favorite chocolate mousse bakery <laughs> and so what I did was I realized something about anxiety attacks they're like an adrenaline I had an adrenaline come down for three days just on a shocking level and I know what a come down is I took a bit of speed to get sewing done in the 60s I know exactly what a come down is so on this Saturday I remembered a letter that Humana had sent me to say that this medication will never be charged and it's been overridden and it'll always be there for Franey. So I go into the chemist, uh, the pharmacy, and he's not there, the pharmacist. And so I go up to this very beautiful, calm, young woman and say, oh, I need to see the man that was here on Thursday, a big, tall man, the pharmacist. And she said, he's not a pharmacist. And I'm still thinking, Baba, 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 in front of this, this situation needed this, like a clear stencil all the time. I knew that. He's not a pharmacist. So let's take a look at the screen and see what happened here. And then I realized it's just a logarithm. It's nothing to do with him. And Baba's one and zero. He can just overcome this. And she just slowly overcame it. I mean, I didn't know, how, I felt like jello at the end. If I didn't know how I was going to walk out to the car because all of that three days of chronic meditation, fighting anger, 
uh, uh, was dissolved by this one person who actually, just as I was leaving, she said, I actually know you from the pharmacy that closed, and this is to do with that pharmacy closing and this transfer. It was nothing. That was a logarithm. <laughs> and this is what we have to deal with. This is the world. This is, and Bob has given us his name, his name. We don't have to do anything, as Tony said. We don't have to do anything. And um, anyway, thank you, Gabrielle, for giving me permission to bring up some of my personal yeah. stuff, which I put on a back burner most of the time. And, of course, I wouldn't have reacted. It was for me. It was for Franey, you know. Uh, but I didn't react. Woohoo! <laughs> I wasn't impulsive. But the world is there. It's just Baba saying... I've given you the tool. Get on with it. Beautiful. <gasps> yeah, beautiful. Go ahead. Jay Baba, everyone. Um, so yeah, so here we find ourselves facing all this turmoil in the world today and what to do and how to react to it. Um, that often goes through my mind, but, uh, you know, on a daily basis, of course, but I, as always, I leave it all to Baba. But recently I've been reading um, Sheila Kalchuri's book, you know, Bao's daughter, Sheila. And at one point she is at the age of, I would say 10 or 11, 12, somewhere there. And she had very close connection to Baba and was with him, you know, uh, periodically over a a span of 10 years or so. And she's a very precocious um, person. Even as a child, she was very precocious, very outspoken. And Baba always encouraged that. So at one point, she has a very telling, um, I mean, a very um, uh, notable discussion about Mahapralaya. You know what that is? The Mahapralaya is the destruction of the universe. So it goes something like this, and I'll read you a little portion of that. So she says, many times he mentioned the Mahapralaya, destruction of the universe. He spoke about it seriously, and it was frightening to listen to his descriptions of what would transpire. He mentioned that India is so hot and dry, but as the Mahapralaya approaches, all of a sudden, all the climate would change, and it wouldn't be for the better. Why not, Baba, I asked. If it is cool and there's plenty of water, isn't that an improvement? No, nature should remain how I created it. When people create so many sins, things do not remain as they should. The Mahapralaya is coming, he stated again, and added, soon. How soon, I asked. You will see it with your own eyes. Areas that are usually dry will flood suddenly. There won't be enough food for people. When the Mahapralaya comes, all the evil in the world will be destroyed. So many will die. They will die like ants. Will everyone die? No, not everyone. Those who are good will survive. Those who are holding fast to my daman. How will we survive without food? Remember, she's a child. Half a bhakri, he says, I will give to those who are holding my daman. Bhakri is, you know, the peasant food of poor Indians, like a like a chapati. If you hold on to my dam until the end, no matter what, no matter how much you suffer, definitely I will save you. We are already following you. Whatever you say we do, that much is enough. I don't want to live, she, then she goes on to say, I don't want to live if during all this destruction, my hand is gone or my leg is torn off or one eye is poked out. It won't happen like that. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Hold tightly to my daman. If you do that, nothing will happen. Sometimes, she says, my mind becomes very disturbed. Think of me, Baba says. I try to take you towards the goal. But if you let go of my daman, if you stop remembering me, what can I do? Baba had mentioned floods, and he spoke again of earthquakes also. I said, Baba, earthquakes don't occur in this area. God knows one day it will happen and everything will be destroyed. People too, not those who are holding on to my daman. 
Baba added. When the Mahapralaya comes, I will be in Merabad. Are you moving from Merazad? I asked excitedly. Yes, haven't you seen that crypt? I will be staying there. You'll be staying inside there? Can I stay on the hill too? You will be around me always, so don't worry about it. But I want to be near you when the Mahapralaya comes. It's frightening to see so much destruction. I should be near you. You can if you want to, but take my name. That will help you. So he says, so she, you know, she goes on to say, I do, but sometimes if something falls on me or if I'm in an accident, I could die all of a sudden. I might not think of you at that moment. If you take my name every day and remember me more and more, you will remember me at such times also. I will help remind you to take my name. I will come and help you. So then she says, about the Mahapralaya, I asked, but you said this world is all a dream. It is, everything is a dream. But when you see me, when you see me, my physical form, it is not a dream. Right now you're looking at me, it is not a dream. Even when you see me in a dream, that's reality. But you don't realize it. You're dreaming and you feel that it is a dream, but it is true. Every time you come in my dream and say something, is it a fact? Is it really happening? Are you really there with me? Yes, I am, but you think it is a dream. Baba added, sometimes when you dream, you are not just spending some scars. These are hints. There are hints to the future in your dreams. Baba mentioned that when the Mahapralaya occurred, three fourths of the world would be destroyed, but those who remained would be honest, devoted souls who never lie or cheat each other. These lovers of God who survive will create a better world, Baba stated. Today, even though I want to save people from their own actions and all the resulting bad things that are happening in the world, I cannot because it is their sanskars that are causing them to act in this way. Even if you try to tell them, they won't listen. So in other words, Jai Baba, <laughs> in other words, leave it all to, to Baba. And, you know, if, if you are, if your everything is focused on him and left to him, you have nothing to worry about. Jai Baba. That Thank you. That was beautiful. I think we could, even it's kind of late now, but yeah. that was a beautiful reading to have just before. Yeah. yeah that. So, do you want to take more hands or do you want to call it a night? Well, I think Tony, uh, Tony might be the last hand. Okay. Or maybe, maybe he's waving goodbye. The last hand standing? The last, yeah. the last, <laughs> it sounds like a movie, the last hand. Or if, if, and yeah, go ahead. I, I wouldn't have raised my hand if I, I assumed you were going till around midnight. So I, um, I, I just wanted to, I, I, um, say that, you know, the, the, it, it, to me, it always felt that the, especially in later years, that the gift that I had to give, what I could serve Baba with was my writing, my singing, my acting, all that. And yet, it was very clear he wanted me into this UN thing for 30 years. And, um, um, the, oh yeah, that the, the main thing I feel that my work with Baba, my Baba's work in me is mostly in my family, in my marriage. It's, it's in these, it's in my inner life, my home life, my, uh, the lessons that are learned developing more genuine understanding of another person or uh, deeper empathy and connection. Um, I did have always had political interest. My social studies teacher wrote in the yearbook, best of luck and all sorts of political uh, implications or something like that. Um, but um, because of Harry Kenmore, uh, he, he was in India in November of 68. Baba called him to be there. And it was the time of the election, presidential election. 
And in the, in the midst of chatting in Mondley Hall, Harry said, well, Baba, it looks like Humphrey's going to win. And uh, Baba said, that's by your will, is it? <laughs> and later, Erich told Harry outside that Baba had told him as early of March, as March that Nixon must come into the White House. So he said, so, you see, it doesn't really matter how the population votes. He said, <laughs> Bob, Bob, Baba can just change the numbers. Did he change the numbers with Nixon and Humphrey? The guy won by a half of 1%. Now, that doesn't mean you tell other people not to vote, but as Baba lovers, you should know that Baba picks the winners and the losers. And, <laughs> and for years, for years, I didn't vote, and I'd always been political. I, I wrote a letter to John Kennedy when I was 10, you know, and he wrote his, he, I got a response. Um, but um, then at the UN, I happened to mention that I hadn't voted to someone, a girl, that, a young woman that I was attracted to. Uh, nothing ever came of it in any way, but... Um, she was from, I don't know if it was Czechoslovakia or something like around that area, but she was shocked and, uh, and horrified that I had the, the privilege of being able to vote and I wasn't exercising it when so many people around the world did not have that. And I realized, you know, what Harry said is so, but on the other hand, on this level, we have to act according to our conscience and our community and all that, and I started voting again. Um, but I didn't get involved politically, expressing my views, until Bernie Sanders. And I'm not saying this to promote Bernie Sanders, I'm just my experience. When I was a fan of his on the radio, he was a guest on Tom Hartman's program, Brunch with Bernie, every Friday. And he called him America's Senator. And I loved the guy. It was like everything he said was what a government should be, and what, what Baba's new humanity would look like it seemed to me so when he he announced for the presidency i was astonished and we we uh, zeke and i we campaigned a bit for him and uh, in the first election he was he won one of the big big early primaries and the press was against him but i this was big and i looked at this picture of baba that i'm looking at now my linot painting and i said baba let him win this. He's clearly going to win. But let him really win this really big so they'll stop saying that, oh, he can't be president. He could never win. And I got the clear. And I felt, by the way, that, you know, I was really clear that Baba was happy with me campaigning for him, that the values he represented was. But when I said that to Baba, I got a very clear sense without words that it's not going to go the way you want. I want you to keep campaigning for him. But he didn't say this in words, but I kind of got, it's not going to happen. He will not win. He will not be the next president. And I did. I kept campaigning. and But all in the back of my mind, I knew I was doing it because that was being true to Baba within myself. The actual outcome was Baba's, Baba's business, not mine. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. Hey, Baba. Yeah. Hey, well, let's um, <clears throat> let's have a few moments of silence. I mean, if Rainey has a couple of things from Francis, and then we have a few moments of silence. But if you're not able to find anything, I'll just read the last uh, sec tiny section of the beautiful, glorious hymn to God the Man. <laughs> okay, and then we'll have a few moments of silence. Very, a very short section, but it's transporting and exquisite. And now again you have walked the earth. But as the moment of your glory drew near, the talk with your disciples died on your lips and the swift glances fled from your eyes. Your brow was a sea of concrete in which no th green thing lived. Your body was all the steel of the world made into a cross on which hung and waited the eternity of the precise moment of your word. 
which was our destroying and yet our renewal and the again path for our stubborn feet. How the glory of your brow is the light of our safe journeying. The love of your eyes is the mirror of our revealment and the certainty of our arrival. How glorious you are as man. How helpless as God. So helpless that you could not hide your godhood even behind the walls of your pain. How very man you are. How absolutely God. Oh, beautiful. Boy. J. Baba. Thank you for sharing all this because we got to hear many different ways that people think about our involvement in the world and our inner life with Baba and how we find a way to balance those, harmonize those two. Beautiful. Uh, I would, yeah. Any, any, uh, as I say, any loose change here at the end? <laughs> I can, I can tell you a, one little story. Oh, beautiful. Lighthearted little story. My friend and I were driving home from Castle Main, about 15 kilometers away, and it was dusk. And you always have to be very careful driving at dusk because there's the kangaroos are out jumping around crossing the road. So I'm driving very, very carefully, looking one side and the other with my friend who happened to be an atheist. And all of a sudden, the kangaroo's right there, right in front of me. And I say, Baba! And I missed it. I don't know how I missed it. And we just both breathed a sigh of relief, drove on in silence. My friend said, can you tell me something about Baba? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, because I must have felt the presence. <laughs> you know, you've got, you've had 50 years of Baba behind that exclamation of Baba. Oh, oh, a mighty boing, Trish. Yes. <laughs> boing. <laughs> Yes. Wonderful. Yes, yeah, beautiful. At, at Disney World, my daughter Clara, who was young at the time, tricked me into getting on a roller coaster, which I thought was just a little friendly ride around the, the, the mm -hmm. circle. And once I realized what was, I don't do roller coasters. And once I realized what was going on, we went up down, started to, I was screaming, Baba, 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 Everyone on that ride got such an introduction to Baba from that trip. <laughs> Spreading Baba's name. <laughs> yes. This is someone he calls on when he's afraid he's about to die. Hmm. Wonder who it could be. I don't know, Marion, we were about to end. Did you want to just say something oh. the last moment? Yeah. It, it, yes. May I? Slip oh, out God. whenever they want, but then there are a few of us <laughs> hanging around. Yeah. May I? Because we're ending with some kind of lightness of being, I couldn't resist this. <laughs> I have told some other people, but before COVID, when we had 
person to person meetings at Mayor Baba House in New York City, I was working on a comedy routine night. So my comedy routine, which I haven't quite completed yet, is about and sparked by tonight to share this um, uh, Mahapralaya as a holiday. And how would we celebrate it? And what kind of gifts would we give? So I'm still working on that. So when I get it together, you'll hear it. You'll hear it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell my husband that he's obsessed with Mahapralaya and he thinks it's a bit of a holiday too. So, you know, yeah. you just go to sleep and yeah. you wake up and you just put the same clothes back on the next day, but a billion years pass by. You know, he sees it as a bit of a holiday as well. <laughs> so one, once I was sitting in Mundley Hall and somebody asked Eric about Mahapralaya and he said, how do you know it didn't just happen? Right, right, right. No, right, it's true. Right. Uh -huh. Because it wipes uh -huh. out everything. No, you're right. Yep. It could happen in a second. We could already be um, into another uh, epic, you might say. I, I often thought it might have happened at the moment Baba dropped his body. Because the, the world was renewed. I saw it was renewed. Yeah. You know? You know how you you know shut down your your computer and and then it kind of resets itself. You have to do it periodically. Any uh, any uh, anything else that? I have a sweet Trisha Rainey story from our daddies. Um, yeah. Trisha's daddy Pat Mooney and my dad Len Eastman worked together, which we actually knew when we were little and younger, but we actually re-found out that fact in India together. But anyway, Trisha's dad rang my dad to say, look, Lenny, I don't know what's going on here, but Trisha's, Trisha's fascinated by uh, this Maya Baba, and I believe Rainey's into Maya Baba, um, follows Maya Baba, and my dad said, oh, don't worry about that, Pat. She's just been the loveliest person since she came across Maya Baba. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's been one of the chief selling points for, for a lot of parents is the, the vast, the, the very dramatic improvement in their, in their daughters and sons. They actually went back to college and graduated or whatever, you know, got off of drugs. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm thinking of next week, just to mention, there are two wonderful guys who uh, came to Baba, I think, probably in the last 10 years. But they had, a, you know, a, many years of, of a spiritual background. But I was going to ask them, I think I'm thinking maybe for next week of sharing their stories. It's very, they're, they're wonderful people. So... I will let you know, Annette. Jeff, how will you be doing effort and grace again? Uh, I'm well. If I do, it would be in the fall. But I've got a. I'm pondering that. Um, yeah, I, I'm pondering that. But it, uh, I think we have been away from effort and grace long enough that um, maybe some of the the farmland is lay, laying fallow for a while, and. Uh, We'll see what, sometimes when you come back to it, you discover that you've integrated a lot of, of the, what is there without really knowing it, you know, and, and you read it and you're, you're seeing it from a different angle. So. Jeff, um, how's Rodney getting on? Oh, great. We, we work, we like to work together. Rodney is, is one of the, people that works at Avatar's abode, and then he comes here in the summer and helps. And a great guy. Tell him I said good day. I will. I'll do that. Good. Okay. Well, I'll, uh, and I'd like to say, any, any topics that you think that would be uh, interesting to uh, explore that that everybody has some experience of. I mean, it ha it's helpful that it's, <clears throat> it's, it's shared experience. Uh, let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this joke, you know. <laughs> so there are these three guys, you know, that uh, go on uh, uh, sailing in the, in the, the, the South Pacific. 
And, you know, one is Italian, one is, uh, uh, one is French, and, and one of them is a Baba lover. And so they're out sailing and everything like that, and this typhoon comes along, completely wipes out their boat. They manage to get to this deserted island with a few things, some water and some supplies. And like they're stuck, you know, and they're waiting around all day hoping that, you know, maybe a boat might go by or something. You know, weeks go by, they're starting to get desperate and everything. And then one day out in the, out in the waves, they see this thing sparkling, you know, and it's coming closer and closer in and they all run out and they jump on this thing and it's a bottle, you know, and they, they take off the cork and this genie comes out. And the genie says, oh, God, I'm so, you've, I've been stuck in this bottle for 300 years. I'll grant each of you one wish. You know, the, and the Italian says, oh, I would have liked to be in, in Venice on a gondola with my sweetheart, with the gondolier singing under the moonlight. Bam! There he is. And the next guy comes along and says, oh, I'd like to be in Paris in a little roadside, I mean, a little a cafe along the, <clears throat> on the street drinking wine with my sweetheart, bam, there he is. And then he turns to the Baba lover, what is your wish? I don't know, I feel abandoned. Can you bring my two friends back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cruel. That's, huh? that's the way they are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We're, we're not the... Uh, the elevator doesn't go up to our top floors, you know. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, I guess we should say goodbye. Thank you. It's great to see all of you. I mean, it seems like it's been like months and months. Months. months, and months. Really? It's it's, uh, huh? Oh, it's, and, it's been dry without you guys. Yeah. You know, it's been, it's really, it's nice to see everybody and to have this to look forward to. It's really wonderful. Yeah. No, yeah. Thank Jeff, you. Jeff, I'll send you this photo. Oh, yeah. There's beautiful photo. Oh. And Darwin, there's Darwin let's, and Jean Shaw. And let's see it again. Robert. Can we see it again? Okay. I'll, I'll speak again. Is that better? Is mm -hmm. that big screen now? Get Darwin yeah. in. Darwin off. Yeah. Yeah, they're oh wow, they're they're big. That's Darwin and wow, there's a there's a, a threesome. Hey. You know, if you put them, you know, if you put the three of them in a that would be like a a, a thousand watt bulb in a closet. <laughs> you don't need that much. And Someone Darwin asked is, Francis and said, What can you tell us about Darwin? And Francis said, You can't talk about Darwin. He's a heart. Uh -huh. All heart, yeah. He is a heart. So you can't yeah. talk about him. It's not like he's just a person. He's a yeah. heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Mara, said, Mara said about Darwin, he was a, a real prince. Mm. A prince in the, whatever, the spiritual sense. A real prince. Jeff, do you want to do... Uh... Three avatar, Mad Baba, Key to... Oh, yeah. Well, wait. Oh, Nasreen, we got Nasreen. Nasreen's Nasreen. here. She's here. Okay, Nasreen, you got to do it. <laughs> yes, okay. Avatar, 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 Okay. 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 Now, thank you, Diane, for hosting. Bye. Yeah. Thank, you. Right. thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. I, I didn't know who RN was, that 